It's spring, and this year you decide that you are going to learn how to garden. You start by buying a tomato plant. Slowly over time, you watch as it grows and grows more and more tomatoes. Unfortunately, you encounter some problems. When you try to feed your grandmother one of these tomatoes, she complains about the bad taste and the fact that they keep dying. She has a point. Traditional breeding programs selected for tomatoes that were bigger and redder. The unintended consequence? Some tomato varieties lost their flavor, and that's not all. These plants have a short shelf life. They are also susceptible to environmental conditions. They also don't contain all of the essential nutrients you might want, and sometimes they lack flavor. But how can we possibly fix this problem? You look around to see if you can find any solutions, and you come across a special seed packet. This seed packet is for super tomatoes. These super tomato seeds have been genetically modified. According to the packet, they are guaranteed to taste great, just like old tomatoes. Luckily, on the back side of the seed packet, there is some more information about GMO modifications of tomatoes. The packet discusses the impact of science, industry, government, and society on genetically modifying tomatoes. Let's start by looking into the science of genetically modifying tomatoes to improve their flavor profile. Before we begin talking about tomatoes specifically, let's go over how protein production works. In our body, we have strands of DNA that are read by a molecule called RNA polymerase. RNA polymerase produces RNA that matches the DNA. RNA can then be transcribed using ribosomes. In the example of a tomato plant, maybe this is transcribing the PG protein. The PG protein is a special protein that produces rotting in tomatoes. Now let's explore the technique known as flavor saver. With this technique, let's imagine that we have a piece of DNA with the PG gene. This PG gene creates a protein that causes tomato to rot. In this technique, we add a synthetic piece of DNA that is antisense or opposite to our original DNA. What this will create is two pieces of mRNA, one that matches our normal gene and one that matches our synthetic antisense gene. Now instead of the mRNA being translated into protein, these two pieces of mRNA bind together, resulting in no PG protein production. This means that the PG protein cannot produce rotting. Complicated, right? And too expensive, it didn't really catch on. But new gene editing techniques might hold the key. CRISPR is a really cool invention that allows scientists to locate a specific region of DNA. So say that we have a strand of DNA from the mutant GLK2 tomato. This is the tomato that lacks flavor. Then scientists are able to make a piece of guide RNA that matches this gene. Using some protein complexes, this gene can then be selectively spliced out, leaving a cutout region of DNA. This DNA can then be filled in with a new gene. Maybe this new gene is from a heritage tomato, allowing the new tomato to have a strong flavor that resembles the old plant. Going back to our protein production diagram, we can see that CRISPR prevents the protein production at the DNA level, while Flavor Saver prevents it at the RNA level. Techniques from breeding to gene editing all try and enhance characteristics of the tomato through its DNA, but this isn't the only way. Other techniques focus on changing the environment of the tomato plant. One technique uses a symbiote. So in a normal tomato plant, there might not be any special organisms growing on the roots. But when an organism like fungi is introduced, specifically the arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi, it can be observed that there is an increase in the nutritional profile of the tomato plant. Let's talk to Dr. Connie Leung about this. Connie now works at Genome BC, helping prepare educational content for you. However, during her undergraduate studies at UBC Okanagan, she worked with Dr. Miranda Hart, to identify if adding fungi to soil, specifically arbuscular mycorrhiza, could change the nutritional value of tomato plants. Connie, would you mind telling us a little bit about how you got into this field in the first place? It's actually kind of interesting because I started as a microbiology student at UBC Okanagan, so the campus in Kelowna, and I was just studying plant and food and nutrition at the time. And there were a lot of professors at the Okanagan campus studying our best mycorrhizae fungi or just mycorrhizae in general because of the land there and just where the Okanagan is situated. It was very popular to study agriculture in the Okanagan. And so that's how I kind of got started. There are a lot of professors talking about it and it got me really excited about studying it. And I had 
one professor, Dr. Miranda Hart, in the Okanagan, where she had this project, a tomato, tomato project that she'd been studying for ages and decided that she wanted to bring it back. And so that's how I got started in studying tomatoes. What was your favorite part about working in this field? It was the best time because it was the summertime. That's the growing season. So you'd always be on the field during summer and you know, hang out with your colleagues and digging up soil. That was the best summer of my undergraduate years. Connie, would you mind telling us a little bit about your project and how you were modifying tomatoes? Yeah, so the project that I worked on was trying to identify whether or not a vascular mycorrhizal fungi, or AMF, when it's added into the soil, it symbiotically goes onto the roots of the plant. So we wanted to understand if AMF on tomato plants would increase nutritional values of the tomatoes because when AMF is attached onto the roots, it increases surface area, so it increases nutrient uptake and water uptake. So does that translate to increased nutritional value of the fruit itself? So that was our research question. And that's what I spent my summer doing, planting tomatoes, watering them and seeing what happens. In the end, they observed that adding the fungi increased the nutritional value of the plant. Now let's recap Connie's career timeline. She started by doing her undergraduate degree at UBC Okanagan. She then worked on a project on tomato plant modification. Instead of using GMOs, they used that arbuscular mycorrhiza fungus discussed earlier. She then did a PhD in diabetes and obesity research at UBC. Since completing her PhD, she has been involved in science education, both through UBC course development and by acting as Genome BC's educational outreach coordinator. Now that we've seen some of the techniques used to enhance tomatoes, either through their DNA or the tomato plant's environment, let's ask our first question. What are the pros and cons of the four different gene modification techniques in this video? Now that we've explored how genetically modified tomatoes are created, let's look into the industry of genetically modified tomatoes. Let's compare two farmers. The first farmer does not use GMOs. This means that their crops are at a disadvantage. They are considered a normal size, they're less flavorful, and they're not very pest resistant. Now let's look over and see how the GMO farmer is doing. Their tomatoes are larger, they have extra flavor, and they can resist pests. However, there are some ways where the non-GMO farmer does benefit. They can grow less crops, but they are deemed natural. On the other hand, while the GMO farmer can grow more crops, the crops that they do grow are deemed unnatural. This means that consumers may not want to purchase them. The debate around GMOs can come down to increased profit versus ethics and ecological impact versus health. Let's ask Connie what she thinks about this. How can GMO and non-GMO farmers keep up with each other? Especially for GMO crops, a lot of these big seed companies, they don't allow farmers to harvest the seeds from the crops that they produce. So every year these farmers may have to pay or buy more seeds and that is a cost to the farmer themselves and that is a huge disadvantage because in traditional crop growing you produce plants and then you harvest your own seeds and then that can continue for years and years until you perhaps need to buy more seeds. But with GMOs, there's patents, there's government regulations. So sometimes with government regulations, perhaps some countries won't allow the import of specific GMO plants or seeds. And then that causes a detriment to the farmers where they can't compete because these GMO crops could produce a ton more plants, a ton more fruit compared to your other plants that are GMOs. The farmers who are trying to compete with these corporations who are selling these seedlings. And then, so I think both are at disadvantage because GMO farmers are relying on these big conglomerates and companies who produce these seeds and sell these seeds. And then the traditional farmers can compete with plants that grow more or have more pro uh, produce production. And so they're both at disadvantage, unfortunately. This leads us to our main question from our industry section. 
How might a farmer balance potential risks and benefits when deciding whether or not to use GMO technology? To explore this further, let's look into the government impact on regulating the modification of tomatoes. Currently, there are a number of regulations regarding GMOs in Canada. The first is the Federal Regulatory Network for Biotechnology. They approve GMOs before they enter the market. Other agencies such as Health Canada, the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, and Environment Canada are also involved in these processes. However, what is the future of regulating GMOs in Canada? Let's see what Connie thinks. Currently in Canada, it's voluntary whether or not producers need to put whether or not their product is GMO or not GMO. And so a lot of producers perhaps don't. There are some, if you look at your cereal aisle, there are products and you can see that there's a label saying or a line saying this product has GMO components to it. And most of that is your corn or your oats. And so it's voluntary because a lot of the GM products, it's, you know, people have different, different definitions of GM. You have genetically engineered, so your CRISPR products, but then people say the same thing for GM foods. And so with GM foods, sometimes people can also say that if you have traditional crops and your selective breeding, that can also be genetically modified. And so the term is really confusing. And so it's hard to regulate in that specific labeling. Um, what I have seen that has potential for working is in the US, there's a movement now for labeling about engineered products. And that means that this product has been produced in a lab, the genetics may be altered in some way in the lab and then used in commercial farming. This information can lead us to our final question for the government section. How should governments balance population food needs with individual consumers' rights to choose what they want to eat? The final area regarding genetically modified tomatoes that we will explore is society. If you had to pick which tomato plant to buy, would you pick the one with few small tomatoes or the one with many large tomatoes? And how would you make that decision? Often these discussions around GMO crops are a balancing act. On one hand, you're a consumer who loves tasty tomatoes and on the other side, you're a citizen. It all comes down to what you value. You might also have a number of other questions, including is it safe to eat modified tomatoes? Is it healthy to eat modified tomatoes? And is it ethical to buy these plants? Let's ask Connie, how will these modified crops affect the consumer? For genetically modified organisms or plants or food, a lot of the products that are on sale, governments have deemed it safe. They have extensive testing to understand whether or not it's safe for consumers. So that is definitely something that happens within governmental agencies. The other part of it is our environmental aspect of what happens with these GM products. So with the GM products that are resistant to herbicides, we've seen an increase in herbicide use and that could have a detriment to our environment you know, as a contaminant or that can be linked to allergens because people can have irritations concerned with the herbicides and because those herbicides are sprayed on the field that can have downstream effects if wind brings that herbicide down to other places in our societies. So perhaps it's not exactly just the GM foods that we're affected with but perhaps because these foods are in our society there are other surrounding effects. Now that we have finished discussing the society section we can try to answer the question, how might different scientific techniques, such as CRISPR, impact society's perception of GMOs? Today we've discussed the topic of genetically modifying tomatoes from four different perspectives, science, industry, government, and society. Do you think we should be genetically modifying tomatoes? Thank you for watching this Gene School video. If you'd like to see more Genome BC educational content, go to genomebc.ca/education. Thanks for watching.